the name of our show. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Large Glass. My name is Todd. I'm Terry. And this is our weekly show where we bring you a new artist live in their studio to talk to you about their work. How's it going? How are you? I am well. How are you? I'm doing okay, That's all great. things considered. All things considered. <laughs> so it's good to see all of you. I see some people popping up in the chat, like Joseph Barbacci is here already. Good to see you. Um, we're excited about tonight's show we and tonight's are artist. We excited, indeed. It's kind of a, um, a continuation, I look at. Of yeah. Last... And this is, this is somebody we've been wanting to have come on for quite some time, so this is going to be great. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, last week when we had Jessica Brilli on, which was a fantastic show, I really enjoyed talking to her that came out All of right. oh there's carolyn thou renewing her subscription thank you for that um but last week's show with jessica brilly came out of our one year anniversary show yes. where we had several painters that dealt with subjects around pools summer this sort of thing and ken rush was one of those artists mm -hmm. who we have tonight so this yes. is a perfect follow-up to that yep. right yep. indeed a uh, couple of things a little bit of business to cover first of all Noel Claro, if you're watching, thank you very much for A, the donation, and B, the follow on Twitch. You're awesome. We love you. You guys should all be more like Noel. And you can be, <laughs> you can be exactly like Noel if you head over to our website right now and hit that support button and help us out. We would love that. We would appreciate that. And she's here. She's in the chat right Hello. now. First time chat from her. And there's, sh oh wow, Shirley, Shirley is and Audrey are together. And Audrey, hi. Audrey, great Thanks dinner tonight. For the dinner. Uh, okay, so Audrey, Pumpkin Audrey brings us dinner on Tuesday she nights. She does a lot for us on Tuesday. She walks our baby maybe. Audrey is the definition of selfless. We she makes us dinner. It doesn't matter what in the world is happening with her. She stops everything to help us out, and we greatly appreciate it. Mwah. There's no one like her. We love her so much. Thank, Thank you. you, Audrey. All right, let's drink. Drink. <laughs> <laughs> so tonight's drink, as you know, we typically try to find a cocktail or something to drink that pairs with our artist. And we asked Ken tonight, what should we drink? And you know what? Ken loves espresso or yes. a latte. And he's like very proud of his machine that he has and the different machines he's cycled through and the ones he uses. And I thought, yeah, yeah I'm going to do that. I am going to have coffee. Yeah. But then I had like, I don't know, eight of them today. Yeah. And I'm mildly, you know, I probably have an arrhythmia. <laughs> I mean, probably, you want to check? Yeah, I kind of do. So instead, I'm going to have some wine to sort of, you know, counter that and bring it down. So let's see, who's all here? Can you read them off? Uh, I'm gonna... I can. So we got some of them. Uh, Mom is here. Hello, Hi, Mom. Mom. There's Ben, ben Hagenbush. Hagenbush. Hello, Just Park. Uh, no Noel, which we already got. Carolyn, Shirley and Audrey. Noel Claro. Yeah, Memory Vessel, and John Park is also here. Good to see all of you guys. Thanks for coming. This is going to be a good show. I, tonight, I'm going to have an already opened bottle, forgive me, The 19 Crimes with Snoop. I got to tell you, I'm not endorsing particular wines on this show. I typically tell you what I'm drinking or what I'm making, but this one, the whole 19 Crimes series, everything we've had so far has been really good. Mm -hmm. But this particular Snoop, the Cab Red, is delicious. Um, be careful with it. It pairs well with the Martha Stewart wine because they also have Martha Stewart. And they're friends. Yes, and they're <laughs> friends. And she's the, what is it, Martha Shard or something? Yeah, like I think that? it's the Martha Shard. Yeah. Yeah. So that one's pretty good too. Oh, there's Jamie Foster. How's it going? Hey, and I said Joseph Barbaccia earlier. We said hello to him. So I think we've got all of our guests covered. Up. What yeah. are you drinking tonight? So going in alignment with what Ken's having, I'm actually going to have some tea tonight. Um, nice. I feel all alone. Chamomile tea. I'm like an island with my wine. Well, it's like caf caffeine, sedative, relaxing. You know, it's all the drugs I don't, and the beverages. Cheers. Cheers. Episode 84. 84. Which I'm excited about. Thanks for coming along for that ride. You guys are awesome. Let us know what you're drinking yes. in the chat. Pinot Grigio for Joseph Barbaccia. Nice. Boo Jazz Ooh. is here. All right, wait. Boo Jazz always has the best drinks. Let's see. Hudson Whiskey. Um, New York. Backroom Deal Straight Rye. Oh, man. I love Dang. Hudson. Um, they have a baby bourbon. I think it was a baby. No. 
It was delicious. That was the one I had. There's, I really like their products, actually. T-Fan here from Jamie Foster. Memory Vessels here. Uh, Shard doesn't sound right from Noel, just in terms of <laughs> jail time. <laughs> Agreed. It's very tasty, Agreed. though. Agreed. Yep, and an oatmeal cappuccino with three shots. Oh, man. Hazy Jane from 63, who's here. How's it going, 63? Yep. Nice to see you. Very nice. Mm. Snoop makes a mean cab. Yeah, he does. All right, so April is National Poetry Month. And for those of you who listen to NPR and are particular fans of maybe Scott Simon on NPR, this might be a bit of a repeat. However, he said something in honor of the launch of, um, of National Poetry Month that I found to be really interesting and totally applicable to painting. And I kind of wanted to just read from this. So he quotes a poem by Billy Collins, who is a poet, and wrote this interesting poem uh, called Introduction to Poetry. It's almost as if it's his plea to his students or those looking to learn about poetry. And there is a fantastic um, passage in this that I just want to read really quickly because I really like it. Um, and here it is. I ask them to take a poem and hold it up to the light like a color slide or press an ear against its hive. I say, drop a mouse into a poem and watch him probe his way out or walk inside the poem's room and feel the walls for a light switch. I want them to water ski across the surface of a poem, waving at the author's name on the shore. But all they want to do is tie the poem to a chair with rope and torture a confession out of it. They begin beating it with a hose to find out what it really means. I think this is what we do with painting. Where's the experiential endeavor that, you know, just comes with looking? This is what I think he's talking about with that poem and this notion of always having to tear something apart to find out exactly what it means. And that seems to just be the job. It bothers me. So before I go over to the rage desk and, you know, kind of have my rant, I'm going to leave it there. That sounds great. I know that makes you, you know, you, you know I'm, I'm gearing up for something. Yeah. Um, ooh, 63 was saying a lot in there. Snoop Juice from Jamie Foster. But what is 63 saying? It's great. Ken is the man from Sly Puma. Sly Puma's ooh. here. Nice. Um, Beat it with a hose. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Noelle Claire. I love, love Billy, Billy Collins. Collins yeah. Nice. Yeah, with art in general, for sure. Um, Ben's got to get back to his paintings. Ben, this show should be inspiring you to yes. get back to your paintings. Come Indeed. on, man. Come on. Yeah. Um, do we have a pin winner this week? We do have a pin winner. Uh, Tom McGlynn got it. Only guess. Tom McGlynn. How many times has Tom McGlynn won the painting? I or don't the know. Pin? I have to send out a lot of pins to Tom McGlynn. Yeah. There this is the is. new pin. A is for absent. B is for Bloody Mary. It's on the way. We are working on it. Yes. Um, we got to do these things slowly. These suckers are expensive. We're also a little delayed on our shipping right now, but we're going to get right back on it. It's been, April's been a, a tough month, I think, with it has. school and all of that right now. and. T.S. Eliot did say that April is the cruelest month, and we're in the middle of that right now. That so, That is true. That is true. Jamie Foster says, you got beat Nick Blood in you, brother, and I'm going to take that as the best compliment I've had all night. Yeah. I like that. All right. Uh, so let's see. So the pin winner's been done. Yeah. We gave our shout out to Noelle. We did. We talked about April as National Poetry yes. Month. Actually, I just want to add one thing about it because I'm a big poetry fan. There is a, um, if you go to Button Poetry, they have new contemporary poetry by young artists, and it's really awesome. Rudy Francisco's on there, lots of hot poets, and it's really inspiring to see them. So Button Poetry, you can see them on Instagram. Oh, nice. It's I would have thrown love. something on the screen if I, I had know. known. I'm but... sorry. I was just thinking about That's it, good. and I'm like, man, That's good. love that site. I so. was asking my students today in my class that I teach, I said, do any of you read poetry? There was a resounding silence at first, and then one student said, no. No, we don't. And I was like, well, why not? Hmm. And, you know, I found that. I'm, I'm, and, and then she said, wait a minute, are you going to make us do a poem? I'm like, no, but I kind of want to now, yeah. you know. Do you have a favorite poet? Yeah. Well, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot is my favorite poem of all time. And the fact that my friend Derek Hafar just made this beautiful piece around 
that poem. Mm -hmm. It's a deck of cards yes. around the poem. Yes. Oh my God. If it's you guys beautiful. look up Derek Hafar, H A F A R, on Instagram and check out this piece he's been working on. It's beautiful. I think Court Tree Collective is actually. Oh, be they have the courts. Sly Puma's got, yeah, they yeah. have something with Derek yeah. and that piece. And that is a gorgeous piece. I forgot all about that connection there. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. You're smart. I am. You remind smart. me of a lot of things. <laughs> Sly Puma says it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. We have some at the gallery. So there you go. All right. All right. Okay. So okay. Uh, let's get, can I order all of your pins for the year from Carolyn Thau? Ah, yes, Carolyn Thau. As a matter of fact, you can. Because what we're going to do is each pin is produced as an addition of 100. But we're going to be keeping 20 of those separate from each piece, from each bag, from each order. 20 will be separated to be put into full sets that you can order as a full set. Now, of course, we would never argue with someone who was kind of curious about maybe ordering the full set in advance. Of course, now you're putting the screws to me to get them all done real fast. So we'll talk. We'll talk. Um, why don't we start to introduce our artist? We can start. I think it's about time you start to. Sure. Some of it's going to be a little bit of deja vu because I'm going to begin it just as I began last week. And the reason why is that the first time we introduced Ken Rush to our audience was on our one-year anniversary episode, episode 56. Uh, we featured a collection of painters that had the summer-inspired themes. And um, he was featured in addition to Derek Adams and Jessica Brilly, who we had on last week. Um, so he graduated from the Taft School and the Syracuse University School of Fine Arts and also studied at the Sir John Cat Case College of Art in London, England, and at the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine. He's been featured in a variety of publications, including Art News and some regional publications, including Vermont Life. He is in New England. Um, he actually spends part of his time in New York and part of his time in Vermont. Um, he's got works in permanent collections such as the 9-11 Memorial and Muse uh, Memorial and Museum, the Brooklyn Historical Society, the Bennington Museum, and the Syracuse uh, Art Galleries. He's also a children's book author. He wrote some books back in the 90s, mm -hmm. including The Seltzer Man, Friday's Journey, and What About Emma? With works reviewed in the New York Times Book Review, Book List, Publishers Weekly, Smithsonian Magazine, and School Library Journal, Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ken Rush. Hi, Ken. Hi. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? It's going really well. I, I I wasn't sure who you were talking about with the introduction. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's no, you. I'm, that's yeah. that's I'm, you, pal. Uh, that's you. That's you. I, I'm I'm happily um, in a different life now because I'm in my post teaching phase. And uh, I, I was a, um, a visual arts teacher, largely in high school in Brooklyn, uh, in a private school um, for in total 43 years. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I somehow maintained a studio practice all that time. I don't know how. And, and then I decided I was hitting the magic six, 66 and I decided it was, it was either then or never. I was either going to teach primarily, I uh, teach high school kids, where, which was a fantastic profession, um, uh, or I was going to uh, be full time in the studio. So that was the choice I made. And uh, it's it's been a great, well, almost seven years now. Well, um, we're honored. We're honored that you uh, agreed to come on the show and we're delighted to talk to you tonight. Um, we've got, oh, I mean, Ken, I got to tell you, when I was digging through the work, to put up on this, it was, it's intimidating. There's so much, uh, which is a beautiful thing. And I think we're gonna try and hone it down. Terry, at the last minute, I have to say, bef you know, we had you on just a little while ago in the green room before we went on the show officially. And I told you what we had for slides and then Terry snuck one in at the last minute. So I'm gonna pop that up right now, but she has this oh. image. <laughs> and I, I don't know if this is an appropriate place to start, but I wanted to throw that up there. Terry, you usually start off by asking our first question. Well, our first question isn't necessarily about this image, although I do want to know, is this the image that inspired 
the, well, <laughs> this is the this is my childhood. Okay. And and I, I included that when I sent you pool paint. That's a um, you know an old uh, <laughs> coat of color uh, photograph of a suburban swimming pool, and it was it was my family's pool. So that is the haunting image which has stayed with me for a number of reasons, um, both inspiring and haunting. Gotcha. Uh, for for uh, sixty years. Gotcha. Uh, but yeah, I went off that diving board many times and there were all sorts of, you know, growing up type things uh, <laughs> right right there uh, during the 60s. And um, so I've come back to that. And I, I didn't even know that I came back to that with my paintings um, when I when I reemerged into the swimming pool uh, uh, sort of vernacular. Um, but that that was the inspiration. I'm so glad you put that that photograph in it seemed like a good spot to kick it off a, actually yeah a good, that's, diving that's, point. Right. <laughs> a good point to dive in from. <laughs> and it that totally surprised joke. me because i didn't you know i i sort of sent that as oh here's just to give you some background right so thank you i'm, yeah. I'm, I'm pleased well, and then this is a very recent painting um and uh, actually, actually, I think I'd call this one, I think this is one of the skinny dip ones, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's a small Tondo circular painting, probably 12 inches. Um, one I did during COVID, uh, one of about 140 oil paintings, um, all of them small, uh, that, that were my second series uh, during COVID when I began to, I think, um, uh, try to find an alternative to all the all the crazy crazy stuff in the world and the and the you know frankly the very bleak and depressing and um, yeah. frightening yeah uh, well and this is kind of a relief to all of that well but, that, that that was it so I began to you know part of it was to create these sort of idyllic uh, almost Arcadian um, and sometimes very abstractly the, this painting is. Um, uh, it was kind of an anomaly, but it was one of my drone paintings. I become sort of a human drone. It's like an out-of-body experience. <laughs> I love this one. There's a and it was only when I, this is a larger painting. This is actually, actually uh, uh, three foot. Um, and uh, it was only as I finished it, because the way I work is, is extremely intuitively, that I realized the pools didn't have any houses. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I thought, well, what, you know, because I, I was thinking all along that the pools were the houses, that the, the pools, that each one of those was like the subdivision. Uh, uh, and that um, that's all you needed was a pool and and maybe a, a big oak tree, you know, hanging over it. Right. Um, but you were going to ask him, you were going to ask him to kind of get into a, a, a sort of, yeah, like a generalized sense. So we know what it is you do. We and are, we know the series. And we know the series. We're very big fans of your work. But um, some of our audience members are not familiar with your work. So usually what we do is we have the artist just give us a general sense of what it is that you do and specialize in. Yeah, just from an overview standpoint. You know, we know you're a painter, yeah. but let's, uh, can we start from the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or in well, a general. That was the beginning. But, yeah, that yeah. was the beginning. But yeah. I mean, just in a general sense. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I am a a I am a painter who largely, and I say painter because um, literally that is that is what I do. Um, only, actually, which are included in this slideshow. Uh, only recently have I returned to a series of doing drawings mm -hmm. and I'm doing them with paint marker. So really it's kind of a hybrid between a painting and a drawing. Uh, but basically all of my drawing happens on the canvas with paint. Mm. I, I, I don't, I don't like use pencil lines. I don't use um, charcoal. I don't, I don't, I don't even really use, uh, normally I don't use like very, very thin underpainting. I, I, I basically, start out just painting shapes yeah and this this is true whether i'm doing a pool painting or um for the last 30 years uh my sort of vermont or new york landscapes uh so i would say 90 percent of my work is 
imaginary, uh, based though on experience. Uh, it uh, there there may be you know glances at photographs or at, at stuff on the internet uh, that's that's um, uh, just you know advertisements like whatever it may be mm -hmm. right. She was saying just right. like, like to like to inform like a memory. Oh, or something. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, for ex for example, during these pool paintings, I became obsessed with all all swimming pool movies. Uh, and so I literally uh, looked at everyone I could. And I, I read the great John Cheever's short story, The Swimmer, um, which is very much a reminder of my childhood because it's about a man uh, swimming across Fairfield County in different people's swimming pools and well, through their backyards. It's funny, Ben. <laughs> one of our chatters, Ben Hagenbush, said earlier, I'm reminded of the movie The Swimmer. Um, oh, so <laughs> I love that. Yeah. <laughs> So well, and and also other movies, you know, uh, uh, that that are, you know, The Graduate. Look, I was yes. eighteen years old when The Graduate came out, and and the the pool there, which is like a great womb or a, you know a beckoning sexual experience, um, is is uh, uh, you know is just riveting. Uh, I even discovered a a Alfred Hitchcock pool scene, which I had never known before by by again immersing myself mm. while i was doing these paintings marnie the film yes. oh God, Hitchcock's I love marnie. Marnie. and there is and i and i based i i did a painting uh very much like this and i did a painting uh and it's a it's a woman who is floating seemingly dead in a swimming pool on an ocean liner at night so you can't get more poetic than that, um, you know. <laughs> typical Hitchcock, uh, but but the funny thing is, what what happens to me is often I will do a painting and then I'll find the source afterwards. Mm. That's part of my process, right? So, for instance, with my landscapes, uh, I've I've done hundreds, uh, no, actually actually around a thousand landscapes that are imaginary and. Um, for many, many of them, I've actually discovered the location, not the specificity of every detail, but suddenly it's like, oh, that's the house. That's the house I paint. Mm. Uh, uh, those are the those are the those are the mountains. Um, so you're saying, you know, so you're saying yeah. that as you sort of work from imagination and the image begins to emerge in repetition, you wind up sort of identifying a space that might Absolutely. be. I see. Absolutely. And it's it's it is very much like when when I go to which I don't do nearly as much as I would like to, but it's just I'm in a different phase of my life. But when I would go to a show of where now this is from a film. This one is from a film. All the other ones you saw were imaginary. Ah. This is from uh the film uh <laughs> God, I should have written it down. It's like 2003, and it's 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 like a version of La Piscine, uh, mm -hmm. the swimmer, the mm -hmm. French film. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll come I'll come up with the name. We'll put it out on blog or something. Um, so I literally uh, I literally took a photograph from the television, and from that uh, I created this painting, hmm. um, and. Um, uh, it, it was that that's how that's how closely I felt this painting captured my spirit. Is it possible? Of, is it possible that the name of the film was simply Swimming Pool? Yes, it is. OK, because. Yes, it is. OK, so yeah. Ben, Ben, Ben Hagenbush in our chat, who is brilliantly knowledgeable about films. Right. You, you were trying to figure out the name of it and he just types it in Swimming Pool. And I'm like, that's exactly it. How yeah. did you get that? That just blows my mind sometimes. <laughs> but OK, sorry, I had to marvel at that moment. Plus, so, so, um, so this is so I will take I, I will unabashedly uh, take sources from anywhere. I mean, my kids, uh, when I taught high school, used to I, they would overwhelm me with their creativity because it was so fresh. And, uh, you know, some of their work ended up happening in my hands in my studio. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's, that's the, I, I am a believer very much that artists absolutely need to, to in, in, come with whatever is out there in the world mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and let it sink in mm -hmm. uh, this painting, which I'm is, uh, this is about a, 
I think this is maybe another 12 inch Tondo. So these are on stretch canvas on round frames. And um, in discovering the Tondo for myself, uh, and there's one in the background of my screen save, as you see, um, was sort of a revelation. It happened during my, my COVID swimming pools. And um, this painting was one of many in which I, I feel the pool has become uh, very much in a Freudian sense, female. And uh, it is, it is the, in the round circular shape is so much better suited than the rectangle. Um, so, you know, the, the other thing is that the way we see, I'm discovering, is of course we don't see in rectangles, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we 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 really don't. We right. we see we see in circles right. and uh, uh, with our peripheral vision. And I'm not I'm not at all a scientific sort of artist, um, but uh, I I've I've very much enjoyed that, and I like the way that you know the tondo was used in so much religious work in so many different. Uh, cultures, uh, Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, uh, the Renaissance uh, in terms of Christianity, um, and, you know, the circle having its own sort of spiritual uh, uh, majesty and kind of sense of, sense of, you know, <laughs> the universe, the, the stars, the sun, the, the earth, you know, the cell, all that sort of thing again and again and again. And, and the, the, by putting a swim, these swimming pools into these tondos, I felt like I was slightly able to giving, give them a bit of a numinous, uh, you know, possibly even slightly like a sacred feeling of some, wow. of some sort without being so precious. I really, Maybe all that's a little bit bullshit, but I, it's fun no, to say. No, I really actually really wanted to get at some of your thoughts behind these circular pieces. And I, I have to say, I love the ways in which the various kidney shapes of the pool or the rounded shapes of the pools sort of integrate with that edge of the canvas. Mm -hmm. um, and, right. and, and, you know, it's not to say that all the rectangular ones feature rectangular pools and all the circular ones feature circular pools, but there is this kind of really beautiful connection that sort of hugs that edge and creates this, yeah, you know, like, in, like I love this one. Yeah. Way, right. Right. So, yeah. Right. And, you know, the other, the other thing, which is, you know, I've had to come to grips with being a, um, a rich white kid from the suburbs. And uh, uh, during really the age of, of George Floyd and the, the sort of um, uh, awakening of, uh, of uh, uh, consciousness of how deeply uh, our um, societal racism goes. But, um, you know, uh, my paintings are sort of are sort of a reflection of oh, if the world can only be I, in certain in certain respects, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, in 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 point of fact, the the pools I grew up in, uh, everybody was white, uh, you know, including the lifeguards and et, et cetera. And you know, it's um, I, I bring that up, but it's uh, uh, just to put it out there. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I and I'm glad you comment on that, and you kind of bring it, you bring it around in some of these paintings. By, you know, uh, there's some other paintings that go towards this a little bit, and I'm trying to scan through them to possibly jump ahead. But I like the way in which you represent people in your paintings and a diverse group of people in the mm -hmm. paintings. I think it's to kind inclusive. of directly address that. Now, I did just jump way ahead in the timeline, I think, for you a little bit. These are newer works, correct? Well, well, it's only newer by about 10 or 12 months. OK, OK, <laughs> but that's, you know, you're working on. These Remember, maps. I'm spinning stuff. So this is a these are lar large drawings. This is a 40 inch drawing. This is legitimately a drawing, not a painting. And um, I'm really inspired, totally inspired here by classical painting mm. and by by traditions uh, uh, that, you, that you might see in French Impressionism or Post Impressionism. Yeah. Um, so so these are these are are but in this is a large oil painting. Oh, sorry. So I meant I didn't mean to switch mediums like no, that. No, no, no. Just... That's fine. But it's the same. So so what's interest what's interesting to me is that. 
is the shift in style. These are highly in, like encaustic. They're not encaustic, in fact, but they're highly um, impasto, mm. uh, painted with knives. Um, it takes like three months for the surface of the paint to even dry, uh, which is a little difficult if, if in case somebody's interested and says, well, I'm, I'm you know, I, I need that right now and I'm, I'm going to buy it. Well, <laughs> smudge. Uh, anyway, um, but uh, these are sort of very much just a letting it all out. It's like letting out all of that 140 controlled little paintings. This is very much inspired by David's um, uh, Rape of the Sabine Women, for mm. example. Yeah. It's a very specific reference to French sort of grand manner painting right. of the of the 18th century and um uh because i love that stuff um i, I both love it and hate it well and there's uh, a lot of really beautiful references to some of these classical paintings mm -hmm. in here you know like when we see something like this too right well this this is very but, but this is this is actually my version of of uh Watteau's uh, embarkment to Kithara. Uh -huh. But you know, you know, while he had the French aristocracy uh, uh, about to embark to this this um, magical Kithara ideal island of love, um, uh, basically, I, I was I was just sort of thinking, well, what if we could embark to Kithara now and and kind of sail off into this this uh, magical, sort of sort of world and that sort of white smudge on the on the right is actually i think it's a, a statue in the original painting of apollo mm. or something like that ah. um, but it's very rococo and um uh, yeah, I'm glad you chose that one. I want to I want to jump on to uh, some of the stuff that's going on in the chat real quick because I want to get caught up. We've got a lot of people talking in the chat. And so I want to re sure. I want to relay some of that to you. Um, also, if you are in any of our chat rooms, please feel free to comment or ask questions. And I will try and relay those to Ken as quickly as possible. But over on YouTube, we've got Jackson Y it says, Ken is an amazing teacher and also a fantastic artist. I needed to get that in there before it scrolled off. Um, Joseph Barbaccia. Has, Thank you, Jackson. <laughs> Joseph Barbaccia has a question. He says, before Ken retired, were his paintings so idyllic? Oh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, uh, I think you will see maybe some of the landscapes before I retired. They, my paintings were not this much fun. Mm. Okay. They, they were not this, they were not, they did not, I don't think express, uh, I think these paintings express joy, but, but I will say that, that I reserve a little spot in each painting for some pathos. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because I, I don't think that either exists um, without the other in uh, kind of an authentic way. Right. Uh, so, so, but, but there is a joyfulness that I've discovered since I retired, uh, since I went through a sort of transformation hmm. uh, at the age of 67. Uh, and when I, I, I emerged uh, really at the age of 68, uh, uh, I was able to express, I, I think, some of the joy in my work that I that I used to, I used to really have in my classroom, yeah. And and what I used to see in the students' work, right. Um, uh, so I, again, the really, you know, when I retired, the, after a year, I went into such a stellifying depression because I no longer had the school. Yeah. And I no longer had my students. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, it was it was terrifying. Uh, um, I had my art. I had my wonderful family. Uh, but I did not have uh, at 730 every morning going into the art room and uh, kids coming in and that exuberance and the colleagues and all that sort of stuff. It was a very different, different world to be solitary um, uh, in the in the in the studio. I can uh, I can completely relate. Here's where I am. Yeah, which, which 
just where I want to be. Yeah, and I can I can completely relate to that. While I haven't lost those students yet, I do miss them tremendously. Um, and it's I, I really get that feeling, and I'm I'm worried that that day I'm going to have to make that same transformation. Let me throw a couple more comments out here to yeah. you. Uh, let's see, we've got uh, memory vessels mentioning feeling a Hockney vibe. Uh, somebody's mentioning like a messy Surat. That's coming from sixty three. Um, Thank you. Yes. Uh, I hate username 67, who's actually Glenn Lavertu. He hates it when we use his username. Uh, and he's saying something I had thought of. He said, I'm reminded also of the bathers in both Renoir and Cezanne. I was thinking of Renoir in this one, actually. Um, but uh, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, what did I miss here? Can you catch something? Oh, uh, memory vessels question. Yes. So how long do each of these compositions generally take for you to complete? Oh, <laughs> you know, there was a great answer to that. And I, I'm, 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 I'm going to um, appropriate it. There was an artist who said, well, it took it 50 years. Yeah. <laughs> because that's how long that artist had been painting. Uh, uh, okay. In the specific, I will do 10 or 15 or 20 paintings simultaneously laid out in my studio, small paintings, and uh, two or three or four large paintings. The painting you're seeing right now, um, which is, uh, which I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm another one I'm, th this is still wet. Uh, this painting happened this winter over a completed landscape, which I had basically spent uh, on and off probably four years on. Oh my God. Oh, wow. But I did this painting within about two or three hours. So huh. how long did it take? Yeah, that's a great. <laughs> did, it, huh. did it take three or four years or did it take did it take 90 minutes? <laughs> I, I love know. that answer. I love that answer. And this is an example of that answer. Yes, it, it, yes, yes. So if you when that paint falls off <laughs> because maybe structurally, whatever. Um, <laughs> Chemically, and, there's no bond. <laughs> I'll be long gone. So it doesn't really matter. But when that paint falls off, someone's going to have another painting. And it, it's going to be a one of my Vermont landscapes. Glenn is mentioning that it was Franz Klein who said he was the painter who said the painting took 50 years. God, I love it. Right. Oh, and it's not interesting because Franz Klein was one of my uh, high school uh, senior year. I my my art gods because of my my great teacher, who was my mentor, my art gods were Edward Hopper, Andrew Wyeth. And Franz Klein. Ah, yeah. that's why the quote sticks. Yes. Huh. Uh, Bujaz, one of our viewers, says uh, Ken's work is where impressionism meets expressionism. And I, I, on that note, I kind of want to bounce back to some of the pool projects because we didn't really get through, sure. you know, that whole inventory. And I just want to keep cycling through these as we continue to talk. Um, so one thing I wanted to bring up, and this is one of the first things I saw of yours that I fell in love with, is. Um, these are hard to find viewers. So if you go looking for these, I, I'm going to try and put links to them in the YouTube video once I post tomorrow. But Ken did a series of um, videos on YouTube. Was it called Let's Paint? Let's Paint. Let's Paint. It was, yes. It was my, my COVID Bob Ross video. Oh, my God. We love them. We love them. And the, the difference between Ken and Bob Ross is, you know, Ken just like, he kind of takes the phone and he he slams it down on the desk and he's like, all right, you just got to go at it. And he grabs the brush and bam, he's the canvases are physically moving on the wall as yeah. he's painting them. But what I love about this, other than the fact that you take a different approach than, you know, than Bob Ross, is that you you have a directness and a, a sort of an authority with your paint. You you have a confidence in your paint and what you do in terms of your mark making that to me is so inspirational i mean you take the tentativeness out of anything is gone it's well just you like... actually even talk to it you're like come on you know at some point during one of the painting things where you're really just kind of where it's a very physical dialogue that you have going on when you start your process is well that... it's so interesting you should say that because i a part of that again comes from i i was a, as a teacher i believed in the power of the demonstration hmm. That means the teacher, the art teacher, stands up there with a canvas and come hell or high water, makes it happen in front of the kids. That's tough to do. And you've got about and, and you've got five to ten minutes if they're ninth graders. 
<laughs> before you've lost them. Yep. So, so I would bang out these <laughs> images, I swear. Yeah. I would just bang out these images, usually using uh, a favorite medium of mine was, was, ten, was uh, poster paint. Hmm. Uh, yeah. You know, the, the temper paint you use in schools. And, and I, a lot of my oils I use as if it was a, a poster paint. Right. Um, and the other is that it, if you looked at my work from the seventies and when I went to art school uh, and then uh, for the, for the next five or six years, it was excruciatingly painfully controlled uh, uh, realistic uh, uh, imagery, you know, subway stations, um, you know, all this kind of kind of stuff. Um, and uh, so I sort of forced myself into a box. And then I think I've spent f the last four decades, now five decades, getting to the point where I could actually branch out and let go of the box. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these, all the ones you're showing are from the, this, the series that, that um, they tend to be small. This one might be 20 inches, but they tend to be eight by 10 inches, but it was just one after the other. And this is a good one to show because it shows the use of the glaze. If we can, can we go back to, or, or you just go, uh, I yeah, can, just that one, one, that one, one painting. Okay. So he, this one, for example, the underpainting, which is very, very fast would be all of the, you know what I'm doing? I'm pointing at the screen as if you can see it. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the underpainting would be, for instance, the green, uh, the blue, uh, the, the, the warm white, okay? Mm -hmm. The overpainting is the shadows uh, and then the highlights. Huh. And those shadows are glazes, which I put in an oil glaze. I'll put it in. I could put it in, and it might take 10, 10 to 15 seconds for me to put it over a dry oil painting, which I worked, you know, some hours on. Uh, and then I, I wipe it out and that's it. So in the next one. Which is down here a little bit. And I want to make a comment on this when you're done yeah. with this part, because there's something I'm thinking of, but go ahead. So, so what, so, so that green you see back there is in shadow except for the one or two wedges right. just as the white is in shadow except for the few little spots well that shadow is is basically just a uniform glaze that i virtually wipe on the canvas as fast as i can to keep the spontaneity uh and i either erase some of it with a cloth or i get it right and i just leave it and that's that's my finish. That's the finished painting. You know, and I was curious about this in your work because I always found that when I looked at these pool paintings, either the ones that are sort of done in, let's just say, elevation or in ones that are done in plan, that there is this really interesting psychological aspect to the light and shadow in these. That is, you know, there's accuracy is not the word I'm looking for, but there is something very authentic about the presence of the shadow, but at the same time, separate. In other words, authentic yeah. as in it connects to the object, the sun happens to be blocking at that moment. But then there's also this otherness to the shadow that feels like it's like the figure overlaid over the piece. Or in this case, the one I had up a minute ago, it implies yes. this kind of looming kind of distant mm -hmm. presence. Mm -hmm. Right, there, that, the shadow is the pathos. Yeah, uh, the sunlight is the joy uh, a, a, a little bit, um, but the sad, the shadow could also be the soothing, but it could also be the, you know, you know, it is, it's what to me gives the work a little bit of, of, uh, of mood. It's what gives yeah. it some poetry. Yeah. Uh, we mentioned poetry before and, and that's exactly, exactly what I try to get. Otherwise, my these paintings are really very um, healthy uh, exercises in 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 sort of like a, a, a graphic design, uh, and I say that in the best sense because because that's where real art happens. But for me, the the shadow makes it takes it from being a draw a, a design to being to being a to being a moody painting. Gotcha. Or if we get back to the film analogy, uh, it, it, it's what gives the, you know, the film 
its uh, its texture. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I got a quick question. Shade, I'm sorry. I have to say, light and shade is, of course, everything, and it is the metaphor. Uh, it is the it, <laughs> the light and the shade, the the mystery. Oh, there's Marnie. There there's my is. painting of Marnie from the Hitchcock movie. Gotcha. Gotcha. But I made this. I made this up. And I had finished this painting, and then I discovered the movie Marnie. Oh, wow. wow. It's almost like you channeled it <laughs> yes. somehow. Man, it's fantastic. Yeah. Which um, is in black and white, by the way. So Marnie I have, is black and white. I have a quick question for uh, the chat, and particularly Stephen LaPuma. Stephen, are there still pieces of Ken's available at the gallery? Because those marker drawings are delicious, and I yes. definitely want to put a plug out there yeah. for those because... I feel like I got first dibs on those and I want everyone else to have a crack at them, but let us know in the chat if they're still there and we're gonna point everybody in that direction. Um, that was one thing I wanted to say. Then there's a couple, a couple of other <laughs> things in the chat. Uh, absolutely, he says, come and get them. Yep. That's at the Court Tree Collective in Industry City in Brooklyn. I do not have the lower third for that and I don't know why that's a stupid move on my part. I should have that, um, but you can definitely Google the Court Tree Collective mm -hmm. and uh, get out there and see it. And I'm sure Stephen will put that link in the chat when he gets a chance. Um, the other thing I wanted to do is now, I wanted to- I, his... I have to do a shout out. Go ahead. The reason, okay, what happened is Stephen uh, uh, came to my studio. This was just before COVID, I believe. And um, yes, it was, it was before COVID. And uh, he was, um, interested in some paintings which i was doing which were basically transforming prints of my early paintings into paintings uh a g clay sort of glaze process and he he looked around and he said well why aren't you doing the swimming pools like that that swimming pool you did in 1971 why are you doing more of those and i was like well you know blah 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 well he left and basically i did 140 swimming pools yeah thank you Stephen. there you go we all we all need we all need we all need outside voices in yes. my mind. <laughs> yeah, for sure. yeah, no, for sure. Um, ben Hagenbush says Ken's paintings remind me of my all time favorite era, the seventies. Uh, Jamie Foster says, "Say hi to your dog for me." She, I think she, heard, I think she heard the dog bark in the background. Um, let's see. There's a couple of other things in here. Boo Jazz says there's a lot of suspense in the works that feature the pool. And I think that's especially in like the Marnie image. Yep. Yeah. And some of yes. the darker images too, with the real shadow play and yeah. Yeah. But we're like conditioned to feel like something's gonna happen rather uh -huh. than it being serene, especially if we bring up Hitchcock. Yeah. It's like well, this is the if I can you know, and I <laughs> all you have to do is say, Ken, shut up for a minute. But and I will. But <laughs> <laughs> no, you here's go. The thing. You go. Here, here here's here's the thing. There is a, I, I'm not a cinemaphile in the sense of knowledge, but I, I, I so love movies. And uh, my problem is I would see movies instead of painting. So I, I really dole them out. My wife and I dole them out fairly judiciously. Um, but what I want to do in many of my paintings is if I were a filmmaker, uh, what would that scene be? Mm. Uh, and I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. I don't know if she's utterly alone in this setting, floating on the in the pool. And remember, the pool for all its joy and wonder, you can drown in it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know that that shadow for me is kind of you know I purposely made it sort of a little, <laughs> you know, a little quirky. Uh, if you will, uh, uh, maybe a little unearthly. Um, and uh, the very notion of floating above, I mean, who are we? Are we, are we, are we a drone? Are we a voyeur? Are mm. we, uh, are we Alfred Hitchcock? You know, um, whatever, whatever it, it may, whatever it may be. So that sense of hopefully of mystery and that maybe something could happen or maybe did happen. Uh, that's very intentional. And I don't know what it is that happened, by the way. Right, right, right. And Bujaz, the viewer, suggests um, it's open space, kind of like Edward Hopper's work. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of is where the potential lies, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So. yeah. And Hopper, Hopper is with me today. 
by the way, that brings up a, a painting that Hopper did that's related to this. I, when I was 18, my art teacher at, at school took us to the Yale Art Museum and on a, on a, on a trip, and uh, I saw Hopper's uh, Room by the Sea. And uh, the effect of that painting mm -hmm. has never left me. So it's one you might want to want to look up. But simply speaking, it's an open door in a room looking out. Oh, I know this one. Sure. The ocean is if if you were to step out of that room, you would be in the ocean. In the ocean. Yeah, I know that piece. Sort of a Magritte kind of kind of situation. Yeah. yeah. So you have a project going on right now at Industry City, uh, right? I do. And um, I want to put that up here for a second, but you've got a little uh, couple of preliminary sketches for this. You want to talk about it? Yeah, I'm super thrilled. Um, thanks, thanks to Stephen, uh, and and uh, who introduced me to to how uh, Chan, who is the curator of the Industry City um, sort of art projects. Uh, I, I've been commissioned to uh, take a freight elevator, which is kind of out of use. It's, it, they, it is usable, but they leave it on a retail floor on the second floor where Stephen's gallery is. And it's like having an, an end room. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to tran trans, um, transform it into a swimming pool uh, scene. So what you see here is my, my mock-up drawing. The floor would be the bottom square, the center square would be the the wall you would face as you enter the museum. Uh, museum. It's kind of a museum. <laughs> kind of. Kind of. Yeah. Elevator. The elevator. Good Freudian slip. Mm -hmm. And and the side walls are on, on the left and the right, uh, which have are are what I've done is I've done done them from collaged in in photographs of Industry City. Mm. So it's as if the courtyard in Industry City became a swim club. Gotcha. That's the whole idea of this. Gotcha. Did you happen to have a picture of the model? I don't have a picture of the okay. model. I apologize about that. I just have these mock-ups. So we're going to start this. <clears throat> uh, actually, we'll be working, and anybody can come by. And um, for the price of a cup of coffee, you can watch us work. Uh, wow. And I have three of my fabulous former students, um, uh, younger students who are working on the project. Fantastic. Um, so, so that is going to be, it's going to be great. I see, I see, I, I think I'll be sitting there like, I won't be like Michelangelo up on the, on the ladder. I'm, I'm going to be sitting in a beach chair. Nice. Nice. I love that. <laughs> and having you know, pots of paint. Um, so I got a couple of uh, questions coming in. Uh, ben Hagebush wants to know if you ever saw the film Gods and Monsters. There's some pool scenes in that film. He mentions that. I haven't, but I certainly have seen Sexy Beast, which which starts with one of the great film scenes of all time, mm. uh, pool scenes, mm. someplace in hot, hot Spain and this mobster lying like a great beach lay uh, whale huh. uh, uh, on, a, on, a, on a beach blanket next to a swimming pool. Nice, nice. It's funny to see. And sexy, sexy beast, sexy, sexy beast. beast. I'm going to put that one on the list. For yes. Us. Okay. And of course, my mother is actually pressuring me. She says, are we going to see some landscapes? Uh, so I, oh. might, I might cycle back through some of the work, if you don't mind, because I have. Please do. Is that OK? No, um, because everything we've seen has been in the last 18 months. Yeah. Oh, and I'm, and I'm now, gonna, now now we have my landscape. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to what I was going to do is I was just going to kind of pick through these and go along as we maybe talk just about you know, a couple more things here. Um, I'm, I'm curious, you know, with with the whole notion of teaching um, right. and how we sort of talk about our students, you just mentioned again that you're gonna have some former st or some students working on the project with you. Um, how do you find, and other than the fact that you directly referenced the demo, which I really appreciated, how did you find your own studio practice working its way into your teaching? Like how did those two things mesh oh, yeah. or, or work together oh. for you? It was a very close relationship. Uh, the, I think the teaching allowed me to make a living and to do something that almost was like being in the studio. Mm. And, and, and then it also brought me back into the studio uh, uh, because I had to respond to the teaching. So, uh, of course, there were the times when I was simply exhausted uh, and burned out by the teaching. 
and uh, and and I couldn't get in the studio. But 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 more most of the time, or a good deal of the time, there was kind of like a symbiotic relationship. For instance, this is a painting. Uh, it's a, it, and these are big. I, this is a five foot painting um, that I showed at Katarina Rich Perlow, uh, who gave me a one person show back in the mid uh, in 2006. And uh, these big paintings I did during the summer when I was teaching. And I just would, I would, I would work fanatically mm. uh, at my, in my studio. But the problem I discovered is I never had time to sit back and to look at the work. And so now what's happened is that that's the big difference. Now I'll go in my studio and I can look at something. I can look at it for hours or, or walk around and not feel like, oh my God, I'm not getting, I'm not making progress. I'm not getting it done. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, that's, that's the joy of being a full-time artist. That's fantastic. And you know, I found that the reason I asked. And these, these, if I can, I'm sorry to interrupt, but these okay. are all imaginary. These, all, all of these paintings are imaginary and they all derive from the work I did of, of imaginary houses in high school. And so 40 years, 30 years later, I, I continued to do them. But they're also very much related to the Vermont landscape, which is around me all the time. Right, mm -hmm. right. You know, um, back on the teaching thing for a second, and our viewer 63 says, it's funny, teaching keeps me in the studio. Unfortunately, not always working, but that's the beautiful trade-off. And that kind of goes to what I was going to comment on with what you said, Ken, and that is that you kind of are forced to integrate those two things, your own studio practice and the world of teaching so that you can keep the engagement in both places, right? Because if you try to separate yes. them, you don't ever seem to have time enough for either or. Yes, very, very, very much. Uh, and uh, the, I would go through long droughts, um, I, I, particularly in the early 80s, and then I had another one uh, in the late 90s after I finished my doing the picture books. Um, now, now let's go back one, and if or or stay on this if you want. This okay. is a plein air painting. So I this was is going to say some on, of these feel like they're more plein air paintings. Like it would, it's hard. This to is the only one of all those paintings you saw uh, landscapes that's plein air. Huh. All the others are fictitious. Wow. Huh. Yeah. So and you can feel it almost. There's... So here I have found the house that I paint and the roads and the telephone poles, but I actually found them. I was sitting there with a French easel. Huh. <laughs> Wow. Well, what great. about one like this? Is that also plein air? That's plein air. That is, that plein, is air. plein air. That's the other corner. I did both of these, one after the other, uh, several summers ago. Huh. Mm -hmm. Huh. Yeah, you can almost feel it in the way that, you know, you're sort of attacking yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I got to tell that, you. That, now, that is imaginary. And that this is, this so is a painting bizarre. which, uh, uh, this is big. It's a four by six foot painting. Mm -hmm. You know, what's funny, and this reminds me a little bit of the pool paintings, is the greenery in this, and even to some degree the sky, they have a little bit, like if you look at the abstraction, the minimalization that takes place in this landscape versus this, mm -hmm. there, this, this almost reminds me of the pool paintings in how Very much. something about the process of plucking this from the imagination takes, you know, a, a little bit of the detail away mm -hmm. in, in a good way. It's sort of like a memory. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well said. Uh, let's see. We've got Love the Light from Memory Vessel. Joseph Barbaccia says teaching keeps you learning from your students. Oh, yeah, yes. totally. Totally. That's a very good point. Um, okay, this is an imaginary painting. Totally. I like that 100%. we really, I like that we're wow. making this delineation. It's like yes. this one doesn't exist and this one does. Huh. But of course, okay, now, now, thank we're you Brooklyn. for showing this. We're in Brooklyn. This is, this is 1974. This is the kind of painting I did for five years when I first got out of art school and I was trying to make it as an artist. Huh. <laughs> And uh, and the, the funny thing is that these paintings remained unsold and unshown uh, <laughs> until five years ago. And then they got snatched up. The whole series of six of them got snatched up by the New York State Museum. Oh, that's so awesome. They, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's so they're, they're, they're artifacts. They're, they're, they're art, but they're sort of art. They've become artifacts because of age. Gotcha. And gotcha. they are specific subway stations. This is in the Atlantic Avenue Terminal. Huh. which today would be totally different. But, yeah, there's well, another no, one here. 
This is another one, yeah. You know, it's yeah. funny. Uh, Jim Osmond is here, and he says about teaching, he goes, I always felt that the class's 17 brains always beat mine. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I love the collective mind that's in there. That sort of you Good know going. keeps you on well, your toes. Jackson Young is is or was on this broadcast, and he was one of my great great students. And he's had a brilliant career in graphic design, uh, and is, is actually a lead designer, I believe, at Google now. But um, uh, Jackson, you're the man if you're still there. Uh, well, we'll see if he chimes in. And I know we're getting to the top of the hour right now, Ken. I just want to throw in a few last comments here. Ben Hagenbush, in his in the spirit of his movie references, does mention the Warriors as these pieces come up, which I think is a kind of a cool reference. And if you haven't seen that, that's I'm one. gonna have to see that. Yeah, that's one that definitely applies. Uh, let's see. Um, what else do we got here? My mother is telling she, she loves the paintings that you can live in. Everyone feels that way. Um, Noel Claro is agreeing with Jim. Uh, Jackson is still here. He says, thank you to you. Um, this has been fantastic. I've really enjoyed speaking with you, Ken. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, can I do an end note? Yeah, let's do an end note. <laughs> okay, here it is. Look at this painting. Yeah. 19, 1974. Uh, I was like 24 years old. Uh, uh, I, I'm underground. I am confined. I'm painting tile after tile after tile. And then look at the painting in, in, in back of me. I'm 73 years old. Um, I am, I am here, let me see. Directly I'll go like that. Whoop, there it is. Yeah, I know, okay. I know. I'm, I'm 73 years old. I am freed. I'm, I'm no longer doing, I'm no longer doing tile after tile and I'm above ground. Yeah, I love that. So, so for all of you who are younger than 73, there's hope. <laughs> Well, thanks for that. Yes. <laughs> well, Ken, this has been great. Thank you so much. We we love talking to you tonight, and we definitely want to be kept, um, you know, like we want to know about all your projects coming up, so please mm -hmm. keep up us in the loop on that. Yeah, we're very excited about the elevator project, so that's cool. going to be pretty cool. Uh, for those of you who want to check out Ken Rush on Instagram, you definitely want to go over and check out Ken Rush Art on Instagram. Follow him. He's got some great stuff going on on there, and he'll keep you abreast of whatever he's got going on. And if you want to see all these paintings, hit up his website, KenRushArt.com. It's a it's it's a rabbit hole you can go down for a very, very long time. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Ken, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a delight. Yes, it's been really fun. We'll talk to you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. All right, everybody. We're back over here on the main. Should we put on the closing music? We can put the closing music on. I love on. the closing music, but I never know where to find the closing so music. So we we never talk about our art or collections or anything like that. But I will say for my birthday, Todd did buy me Ken Rush pieces. So that was a delight. I have a couple of them to frame. So, and they're gorgeous. Guys, they're absolutely gorgeous. I'm, I'm gonna tell you this, I'm not gonna spill the beans on pricing or anything like that, but if you wanna get something that's really accessible, you wanna start an art collection and you like what you saw tonight, definitely get over to the Court Tree Collective or contact Stephen LaPuma at the Court Tree and talk to him because these are great works mm -hmm. that you can get and it's not going to kill you. So I feel like this is really an, an accessible thing. Yeah. Real, and that's and that's one of the things I love about it. Yep. Uh, let's see. Let's go through our chat. You wanna you wanna do that? Uh, I can. You have the better voice sometimes, Get so I like listening here. to Todd's voice. Mm -hmm. um, but awesome show, guys from Shirley. Memory Vessel says good night. Uh, thank you, TNT from Joseph Barbaccia. Boo Jazz says really nice show tonight. And happy birthday. Thank you very much. Um, and Noel says, wow, such a dreamy present. And it was. Uh, yeah. yeah. 63 says, thank you for a great program. Uh, appreciate Did you say that already? Uh, I don't I'm not sure so, if I'm, if I'm repeating okay. you. Uh, John Park says, wonderful work and truly inspiring person. Thanks, John. Uh, thank you for sharing Ken from Jamie Foster. Uh, Jess Park says, this was so much fun. Loved every single second. You guys, we love every single one of you. Thank you so much for your support. Um, I have to say, 85 episodes in, and I say this every week, I marvel. What? 84. 84 episodes, that's what I said. Re <laughs> but next rewind. Week's 85, but we're there. Yeah. yeah. But I, I have to say, I love, love, love that you've been with us for this journey, and it feels so good. Next week, 
next week. We are back with the Brownstone Art in Brooklyn. We are going to be talking to Sherry Biddle, uh, who has an amazing show mm -hmm. there. And uh, we're really excited to talk to her. Yeah. And we are lined up all the way out through June with some amazing people. So please, you know, stick with us. Yeah. Can't wait. Great content. All right, everybody. Well, on that note, we're going to head out. Have a great week. We'll see you next Tuesday. Noelle! Thanks for joining us tonight and yeah. to the rest of you. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Have a great night. <laughs>